Good day. I'm Peter Green. I was a Baptist pastor for over 35 years and just as I retired, COVID struck. So I found myself pastoring a pastorless congregation from a distance because I moved. They didn't have a place to meet for some for various reasons. It was a very strange situation. So I started with Zoom meetings, then began posting my sermons uh, in videos uh, on Facebook. Lately, some people both interstate in here in Australia and also overseas have shown interest and uh, I've opened this YouTube channel as well. So let's turn to today's talk. Today is the 18th of July and I want to talk about women and hats just for a change today. So the passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 to 16 and we read, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realise that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays and prophesies with his head covered dishonours his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head. It's the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man didn't come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It's for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Doesn't the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him, but if, that, if, the, if a woman has long hair, it's her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Paul hated women. You've heard that said, I guess. Is this passage proof that he wished to suppress them? What about the women Paul was positive about? His friends, Priscilla, the teacher, Phoebe, the deacon, Eunia, the uh, apostle. What about Evadia uh, and Sintiki, uh, his fellow labourers in the gospel, his fellow missionaries? All the evidence suggests he worked more closely with women than most men of his time did. So why do we have problems with this passage? We use it to argue whether women should speak in church, how they should speak in church, and why it is this way. Clearly, the Bible allows women to speak in church. Why is it such a problem? Years ago, there were ructions in our church about letting women be deacons. Some churches still won't put a woman on the nomination form. I heard all the standard arguments. Women should keep silent in church. Women shouldn't teach or lead men. None of the men appointed in acts to look after welfare were women. After I did some hard talking and arguing, even the hardliners agreed that they may as well recognise the women who had already been doing everything deacons do. Paul is clear. He says every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head. Clearly, a woman can pray or prophesy in church. It's about how the woman dresses uh, when she does things. You have enough common sense to know that God looks on the heart, not on how we dress to talk to him. So there has to be something else at work here. Let's think. Later in the letter, Paul tells women to be silent in church. So he clearly doesn't mean that they mustn't pray or prophesy because he's already said they can. Obviously, 
the, some women were being disorderly in Corinth and he's telling them not to be disorderly. He doesn't tell them they can't participate in a meaningful way. It sounds like the women weren't listening and were disrupting the whole meeting. In effect, Paul says, when you come to church, by all means pray and prophesy, but don't disrupt. If a prophet should stop talking in order to give other people a turn, then you women, women should stop interrupting all the time. Paul is not anti-women, he's anti-disruption. So ladies, pray with all your might and may God bless us through it. And if you're sure God has a message through you to correct, to guide, to encourage, then follow your church's policy for sharing that message and God will bless us through it. Many years ago, Kath and her adult son, Will, that's not their real names, were regulars at our church. Kath was tough and outspoken. Will was into rules and regulations for others anyway. Uh, he considered himself a Bible teacher. In a Bible study, Will were, was rambling on, being quite disruptive really, about women being silent and not teaching men. And Kath stopped him. Didn't God speak to Balaam through his donkey? That's right, said Will, not seeing what was coming. Well, said Kath, if God can speak through a donkey, he can surely speak through a woman. You're talking nonsense, so be quiet. She had a point. The answer to whether women should speak in church is a resounding yes. In Acts, it says that the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost means that even slave girls, the, the lowest members of Israelite society, would now prophesy in Holy Spirit power. Paul tells the Galatians that divisions like male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, mean nothing when we're all made one in Christ. So why does Paul teach that women should cover their heads? He begins with everyday life in Corinth of about 50 AD and puts it into a Christian context. We should look at our world not to judge it, but to see how to live as believers in it. What he says applies mainly to married women because it was different for unmarried girls. But they would come to church accompanied and they would come with the guidance of parents and so on. Back then, a married woman wore something like a pashmina around her shoulders and covering her head when she was in public. They hadn't invented wedding rings yet. Some married women even wore an all covering garment uh, like very conservative Muslim women still do. It was like a bag with a window uh, uh, that covered them from head to ground. An unmarried woman dressed like her mother except uh, uh, she didn't cover her head. On the other hand, there were two kinds of prostitute in uh, Corinth as well. There were the ones with elaborate hairstyles and see-through dresses who worked in the city's clubs uh, where the men went to eat and drink and have sex. The temple prostitutes shaved their heads. There were hundreds in Corinth. And the money they earned paid for upkeep of the temple of uh, Aphrodite on a hill just outside the city. So Paul wants a woman to dress modestly for church, not like she's there for sex. He doesn't, he says this shows respect for their husbands, for the other men in the church, and above all for Jesus and God the Father. He doesn't make men the masters of women. Jesus said there was only one master and you can't serve two masters. So for Paul, women and men are not independent. What one does will affect the other. Let's respect each other. But now he turns it back on the men. Stop fussing about what the women do. Worship God through Jesus. Don't please the women. Don't show respect by behaving respectfully. Paul knew the culture. A man with a covered head was hiding something like a lurking criminal, keeping anonymous in dark places. 
And Paul says, if a woman really wants to look like a prostitute, maybe she should look like a temple prostitute and cut her hair right off. But for Paul, it's no mere cultural issue about who is in charge. He turns to God's creation purposes. To Greeks and Jews, headship was about origins, not about rulership. So going back to the Bible and the creation of men and women, Paul says, OK, woman did come from man, but now men come from women. So everyone depends on everyone else. Don't argue about trivia. Long hair, short hair, male and female. It's all good. Just do what's decent in this society, he says. Finally, Paul takes up the practice of the other churches. He says, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. In other words, it isn't just a local matter. You have to consider the other churches. Someone I knew visited another church, sat there for a while and left. I asked why. He replied, their hymns didn't mention Jesus. A church that doesn't talk about Jesus has something wrong, hasn't it? People see what's going on. People see what we believe. They see whether we respect one another. Did the Corinthians want people avoiding them because of the attitudes they observed? Summing up, all Christians are free to pray and prophesy in church, but it's important to observe appropriate dress standards out of respect. If angels are watching, so are people from every part of society. But why does Paul have these restrictions? You probably know already. We've seen that it's, pray, that it's fine for women to pray and prophesy in public. You've seen that they need to dress decently if they're going to do it. We've seen that a big part of that uh, has to do with showing respect to God, to husbands, to the church, and to other, the other churches you're in fellowship with. The Corinthians were arrogant. They imagined that they knew more than anyone else, that they were free to do whatever they liked because they weren't stuffy and old fashioned like other people. It's good to willingly go as far as God leads us, but it's not good to be arrogant and even lawless. A newspaper story once had the heading, Girl Power Turning Violent. It said there's a trend for girls to commit crime and to smoke, drink, swear, and have sex just like men. It's, it had changed dramatically over a few years. The writer attributed it to a distorted idea of women's liberation. These girls think, if I'm not tied down by the old conventions, anything goes. That's just like the Corinthian women. They were pushing their new liberation into wrong areas. Against this, Paul sets two major concerns. Preserve fellowship and don't hinder the gospel. Most of us have seen street prostitutes in the city. If one attended church dressed for work, we'd probably guess what work she did. We'd want to welcome her. We'd want to help her to feel at home because the gospel is for all. But it would be hard not to overreact. But if our women normally come to, to church dressed as prostitutes, wouldn't people think that Christians have church prostitutes just like the pagan temples do, did. Boiling it down, Paul was a liberal about women's ministry. He would be too radical for many Sydney churches and probably quite a few Melbourne ones as well. But fellowship and evangelism come first for him. So, And if anyone has to pull his horns in to preserve fellowship and to ensure that Jesus is preached, then his personal desires mean nothing. People are dying without Christ. You might say, I'm free to eat, to drink what I like. But if your freedom turns your brother away or keeps someone from the gospel, that's a selfish sin. When some Muslim and Hindu young men came to a fellowship night at the church I used to go to, we made sandwiches without ham or beef 
Regardless of what we wanted, each of us should ask ourselves, am I permitting myself a freedom which hurts my fellow Christians or hinders the gospel? It all boils down to putting love into action. Let's do it. Amen.